I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Minister for his work. I remember um, saying at Restoration Day that he had the hardest job of all. I don't think anyone, even him, anticipated how true that would be a mere few months later. Minister, genuinely, I am impressed by your candour, your professionalism and your compassion for all of the people in Northern Ireland. I would extend those similar comments to the wider Northern Ireland executive. It's about people, not politics, finally. I recognise that people are scared, they're confused, fearful for their health and the health of their families. People have died contracting COVID-19 and I offer my sincere condolences to family and friends of those who have passed. My thoughts are also with those who are receiving uh, health care for any illness in all health and social care settings across Northern Ireland, the UK and indeed the world. The circumstances in which we anticipate place them in the most vulnerable position, and I expect they are very scared right now. To all those on the front line, health and social care staff, police, the prison service, pharmacies, retail staff, and all those now working not for themselves, but for others, you have my support, compassion, and representation. Whatever I can do, I will and I'm sure we will, as has been apparent today. To an extent, the agreement of this legislative consent motion is academic. And I'm saying that not to undermine the genuine concerns that have been, been raised by many, not least Mr Nesbitt, Mr Alistair and Ms Woods, that in normal circumstances would be entirely valid and would render probably this bill unacceptable. But I said to acknowledge how serious this situation is. If we are abandoning democracy, we are doing it for survival. And I do appreciate the comments of Ms Kelly around removing the burden of the assembly questions from the ministers. Um, again, I will reiterate, I don't seek to put on any undue burden to an already overwhelmed Northern Ireland executive, but I do seek to raise those queries that I do feel will be lost. I'm sure every member in this House has received considerable correspondence via social media, via email, via telephone. I go to bed at two in the morning and I wake up at seven and those messages are unanswered. And I think the, the, the forum, the, the channel of assembly questions is a good opportunity not to expect answers but to raise queries to ensure that maybe some issues that may have been overlooked are being addressed. Because when we do that, the people that we represent, all of us, including the Northern Ireland Executive, will benefit. This isn't normal, and I sincerely hope that it doesn't become our new normal. When this passes, and you know, I think we're all praying to God and whoever else you know, we, we put our hope in that it will, there does need to be global work to understand why this has happened and how we can prevent it happening again. So I suppose I'm going to use this opportunity not necessarily to debate the uh, specific clauses within this bill and legislative consent motion. If anything, I want to use this as an opportunity to seek clarity or at minimum raise issues to ensure that they're not overlooked and that people will not through the, fall through the gaps in the chaos of survival. Um, I will, however, Mr Deputy Speaker, try and keep it in line um, uh, with, the, with the, the parts of this bill. The practical outworkings of this bill are ambiguous. Even after the Prime Minister's statement last night, perhaps even more ambiguous than they were before. One of the, the, the key areas that I do want to talk about is statutory sick pay, and I know it's provided for in this bill. I really appreciate the removal of the three-day wait. People should not be financially disadvantaged by these circumstances. Statutory sick pay, as many members will know, is typically paid up front by the employer on day four. And I will expect that employers will also empl uh, pay employees on days one, two and three directly. So I would ask the Minister, and maybe he can come back to me if he's unable to answer today, does the coronavirus bill provide a mechanism 
in which employers can claim the additional three days at statutory sick pay, at st statutory sick pay that this bill will enact. How soon will this be reimbursed? And I appreciate this is a short-term financial uh, burden on the employer, but short-term cash flow is the problem which can lead, has led, to many employers making serious decisions which has disrupted their business and disrupted the lives of their employees and may never recover from. Also regarding statutory sick pay, I've been con contacted by a number of employees last night and this morning telling me that their employ employer is requesting a sick note or self-certification to enable them to stay at home. And this is again after the PM's announcement last night. Previous UK Gov did, uh, advice did say that this isn't required, but it does seem that there remains considerable confusion about the liability of allowing people to stay at home. And I'll go into this further. If the employee themselves makes a decision to self-isolate, are they only entitled to statutory sick pay as per their uh, contract of employment? If the employer makes the decision to send staff home, is he or she liable to pay full pay while not receiving income at the other end? If the government, as we have heard last night, instructs businesses to close, then are they taking on the liability to pay workers? And how are they doing that? Who gets minimum statutory sick pay? Who is going to be entitled to the coronavirus job retention scheme, which pays up to 80% of, of wages? Do we advise them to go on to new style job seekers allowance, which isn't means tested on savings and partners income, or the, the sickness benefit of ESA, which is quite similar? Or do we tell them to go on to universal credit, which they may not be applicable for anyway, again, depending on their financial circumstance of savings and partners income? Minister, I'm, I'm telling you all this, and I appreciate it's not entirely your remit, but you're, I suppose you're responding to a lot of the concerns in relation to this more widely, and I do appreciate you for doing that. Um, we nearly need the whole executive here because we could talk about every issue that, that seems to come up with this bill. But it is this confusion that is leading people to continue to work and, and employers reluctantly making them stay. And where you do have a concern is that this will not delay the spread, and that's where we are right now. Another area of concern is on essential workers. If employers who have been forced to close further to announcements this week and last night will be able to access the coronavirus job retention scheme on behalf of these workers. That's fantastic. It has removed uncertainty for them who are nervous about their own health and for the health of their families. I welcome this and I do look forward to more measures specifically regarding the self-employed, which we're hopeful may come today. Mr Deputy Speaker, however, the devil is in the detail, and I appreciate the bill in itself may not uh, provide that, but we have to be concerned about the outworkings of this bill that we are uh, passing, I suppose, via this House and all the other devolved regions, but specifically in Westminster. I'm finding the really fast-moving pace, as I expect all, all uh, members are, as well as ministers, making it incredibly difficult to provide good advice to our constituents. Where I'm finding it particularly difficult is to cross-reference that information with standard employment law, with other uh, uh, law, laws that, that, that are in place. Things are not clear. Many members have said it, but I, I think the point needs to be well made, because that's where the correspondence from my constituents is coming from. It's leading to further anxiety, and again, it is leading people to make decisions about their work and their income. So what is essential? I know some have described it as key workers and those employees that support those key workers. I was contacted by a tyre centre for motor vehicles this morning. Not really an essential service, or is it? What if a nurse, a doctor, or a teacher who's looking after key workers gets a flat tyre where do they go so that they continue to travel to their place of work where they are saving lives? It becomes essential at that point. Off sales. Now, I really wouldn't consider this uh, an essential retail. However, I do understand at this stage why many might disagree with me. Um, but they themselves have not been given any direction. You know, and I think if we come back to the crux of why the Prime Minister had to make this announcement, it was the purpose of them trying to limit people in close proximity, again to delay the spread. Yep, please go ahead. 
I'm glad she had the courage to raise the, the question of off-sales, and I agree with her that m more clarity is needed. Would she also agree that it's particularly important, though no one, I think, in this chamber would responsibly describe on off-sales as an essential service, that there is also the danger of, in these unique circumstances, creating a kind of black market, and that it's important that people have clear guidance on what is and isn't permissible, so that people know, both customers and business owners know, how to operate within the law? Entirely, and I think that the lack of detail and the clarity is, is, is where we are going to find ourselves within difficulty. And again, with people taking the risk that they will remain in their employment um, and, and potentially spreading uh, the, the virus, and that's where we don't want to get to. Sometimes I get frustrated that the message around delaying spread isn't um, made clear entirely. Forgive me for saying this, but I know the Minister himself has said this many times. I think it is inevitable that we will all you know, contract this virus at some stage. But the difficulty is, is that if we all contract it at once, therefore putting overwhelming pressure on the health service all at, want, uh, all at once, which then limits their ability to look after the most sick and the most vulnerable. And when, when their ability is limited, that's when people will die. But to come back to my point about off-sales, the Prime Minister, I suppose, ultimately uh, made his announcement in relation to limiting close proximity. And close proximity can be controlled off, uh, in off-sales in the same way that it can be controlled in supermarkets. So do they remain open? And if they can stay open, will their employees be able to access the coronavirus job retention scheme? Or will staff who want to self-isolate, understandably, be reduced to statutory sick pay, depending again on their employment contract, as per my earlier point? Now, I, I'm genuinely not trying to advocate for off-sales to remain open. Um, but they are going to work tonight, Minister. Gardeners are asking me if they can cut lawns because they're outside. They are not uh, interacting with the people that, that they, they work for. Um, but then we're telling family members that they can't come to each other's properties and premises. So I do think a lot of this advice is really unclear. And whether you can or you can't, ultimately, no one wants to be at work. We're in a situation now where we want to be at home with the people that we live with, with to limit the spread as much as possible. But if they can only access statutory sick pay instead of the 80% uh, wages, then maybe they will make a choice to go to work. It's easy for me to say if and don't, don't go to work, but in doing so, they may not have enough money to put food on their table, they may be at risk of defaulting bills, and they may face legal action. I have a constituent who last week contacted me because they had received an, uh, an intention to enforce repossession on their home that was sent last week from the Northern Ireland Court and Tribunal Service on behalf of their mortgage uh, lender. Has this been thought about? Have we thought about the impact of standard correspondence which is triggered when people miss however many payments within their mortgage contract? which has the potential to deeply unsettle in a context where good mental health is already being challenged. Skilled workers. We are hearing um, services are being reduced, and I fully, fully understand the rationale of this um, to enable delay to the spread. But, Minister, in some circumstances, are we limiting our response of the next phase by our actions within the delay phase? And let me qualify this. For example, licensing has been suspended. But will this include ambulance workers needed in the weeks ahead? Will this include HGV drivers, which I understand we have a considerable shortage of anyway? Mr Speaker, I don't expect all the details of this to be worked out. I think the, the fast-moving pace of this inevitably means that things will be lost, which again it means that I, I do see the necessity of my earlier point to be able to uh, correspond this to ministers. Um, and I have no way to do that now. If, if anything, I'm chasing down their special advisors, I'm writing to the private office, and my method of keeping them informed is much more convoluted, much more resource intensive than submitting an assembly question, which quite frankly, I don't care if you answer. I just want you to know. I would make the point again, I made it when I was minister, I'll make it now, 
The purpose of this assembly is to scrutinise and it's to do it on the basis, not necessarily to hold the government to account, but that is our role. That's democracy, ladies and gentlemen. But it's also there to support ministers in their work. And we do that to, help, to inform them to be the representatives of the 100,000 constituents of East Londonderry and all the various constituencies across Northern Ireland. And it's that representation role that informs them for the job that they have to do, which is right. So I would very much implore ministers to look towards their MLAs. We're here to support you and find out the bits of the legislation that you may have overlooked, the policy that might have unintended consequences. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Forgive me, and another point about unintended consequences. I've been contacted today by constituents who fear for the life of their elderly that are in care homes and nursery homes across this country. Some that are incapacitated in such a way that it is their loved ones that visit them in these homes who they really rely on in this time. We've seen reports in Spain on the recent BBC News that have suggested uh, a higher number of uh, elderly that have now become vulnerable in care homes and have passed away, sadly, because they've not been provided with the appropriate care. Now, while it has been rightly pointed out that many that work in our care homes are, are professionals and are unsung heroes at this time, but sadly, as we have seen in Northern Ireland in the past, that is not always the case. So we have loved ones that, that really want to visit their elderly relatives that they sense are in real danger but are able to do so at this time because, again, we have a message of is it safe to go? Some homes have applied a blanket ban, others have not, but there's no clarity. They desperately need clarity in this time and it's important that we as MLAs can relay that back to ministers at a time like this. Can I encourage members to be brief in their interventions and they, can add their, they could add their name to, to the speaking list if, if they wish. And I call on Claire Sutton again. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I think the point is entirely well made, and I think every member has, has, has mentioned it within their contributions. The need for information is critical right now. When the general public are concerned, when they're anxious, we provide them from information to reassure. Again, it's not entirely a criticism because I do understand how fast paced this is. Um, I do understand that the resources within the Northern Ireland Civil Service are limited. We had a VES scheme which took out a good part of our experience. It took out a lot of our resource. And ultimately, that's why Northern Ireland has stopped its assembly asking questions when the other regions haven't, because our resource here is limited. We are into this maybe a month after three years without um, an assembly. The Secretariat, the, the, the Northern Ireland Civil Service, was run down. They were redeployed elsewhere. I suppose we, we are where we are, and we need to try and put our best foot forward in trying to help the people of Northern Ireland and trying to save lives. But let us help you. Don't be that executive that sits behind closed doors and gets nervous about the input of the MLAs that hold you to account. The legislature, which you are members of as well, let's take their advice, their experience of casework, the, 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 the comments that they're getting um, on the ground, and let's see how we can make this work for everyone so that we do limit the worst effects of this uh, virus. Minister, I really could stand here all day and go through every department and talk about the various remit, about the things that we haven't considered. But your time is so much more precious than mine. But I want us to all spare thought, maybe more than that, because I think we're at that, for all those hundreds of thousands of people that are stranded outside of the UK and Ireland and can't get home, whilst waiting to contribute, I have had messages from Bali, I've had messages from Australia, I've had messages from Turkey, I'm aware of an issue in Peru, and they are telling me that there are hundreds of thousands of Britons stranded abroad. And my concern for them is, you know, where do they go? Do they have shelter? Do they have food? Do they have access to the rights that we enjoy here that they don't in the places that they are visiting? And I can't stress strongly enough that whether they are here or abroad, they are our responsibility if they are the constituents of Northern Ireland. I have limited power or influence on the UK government, and I appreciate that you know, the, the, the Foreign Office that falls within the remit of Westminster. 
But we do have an influence collectively as an assembly, collectively as a Northern Ireland executive. You attend those COBRA meetings. What are we doing about our people abroad? Because that is a concern. If we are anticipating that this will go on longer than a month, maybe three months, four months, what are we doing to try and get our people home? Maybe it's not a priority right now, and I accept that, and hard decisions are having to be made. We heard that yesterday uh, when Mr Alistair talked about his very tragic uh, constituent. And, but I do think it has to be a consideration. They're as much our responsibility as anything else. Um, I wish Minister you well. I wish this Assembly well, because I myself see the work that we are doing um, to try and represent and put forward the views of our constituents and indeed assist and advocate on their behalf. It will be a really difficult weeks, months ahead, but we will come out the other end. And I think that's what we have to look forward to. That's what I'm trying to encourage my constituents to look forward to. Thank you. I now call on the Minister of Health, uh, Robin Swan, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion and the amendment.